Let us begin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Is despair a sin? What do you do if you feel you cannot overcome a particular sin you are too attached to? A sin you struggle with? I will be answering those questions. Stay tuned. I am El Señor Moreno. Okay, that's nice, but is despair a sin? Of course. What do you mean, of course? The sin of despair is a trespass against faith. It is a trespass against the belief in God's infinite mercy and exhaustible love. A person who is in despair is truly selfish because he's in charge. He's in charge by saying that nothing in this world could heal his guilt or shame. The sinner says, My sins are way too big. I cannot do anything about it. I cannot expect God to forgive me. I know better. I know. No one else knows. God doesn't know. He cannot forgive me. I say so. And with that saying, the sinner implies that he and not God determines what is to be forgiven and what not. Judas is a perfect example. He is the emblem of despair. He was a man with remorse, but without hope and faith in Christ. He was in charge. He said, Jesus won't forgive me. That's what I believe. We cannot be or remain in despair. We must remember that each one of us has disorderly attractions. We are falling. We need help. It's understandable that we feel like we are broken and imperfect. That's okay. But we must bear in mind that it is impossible not to sin. See what St. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have seen and fallen short of the glory of God. Above all, we must remember to walk away from being in charge. Let Jesus Christ call the shots. If we have fallen short of the glory of God, it is also true that we are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. That's why Christ came, because we're sick spiritually and even physically. Temptations take hold of us at all times. We find ourselves falling into them, and at times falling truly hard. But remember, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Cheer up. God's mercy has overcome the world, the flesh, Satan. Of it. God conquered the world with his passion and resurrection. God is always willing and ready to forgive any sin we ask to be forgiven. Remember that the first thing that God ever told or said was this, repent. Jesus didn't show up saying quite cheerfully, welcome, welcome everyone, I love you all. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You got a problem? You got sin? No problem. I welcome your sin as well. <laughs> Matthew 4, 17, repent. That's what Jesus says. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What did he say? Repent. What did he say again? Repent. Did Jesus say repent? Yes. What was that again? Repent. What was that again? Repent. Repent. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's interesting. And the Holy Spirit says through John, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness? All unrighteousness. Do you mean any sin, small or big? Any sin at all. It doesn't matter what kind or to what degree. Christ is willing and ready to forgive any sin at all, provided that the sinner has sincerely repented. Jesus wants you to repent. He cannot force you to love him. He forgives you, and then that means that you are welcome Jesus. You are welcoming Jesus to love you and to rescue you, therefore, because that's what we need. We need the love of Jesus. We need to have our guilt healed. Remember, guilt is like a womb. If you struggle with guilt, know that guilt is good. What do you mean good? Guilt is like a wound, but not like a wound on a finger. Ah! 
It is like a wound on the soul, very much as a wound on a finger warns you that you need a band-aid. A wound in the soul warns you that you need a spiritual band-aid, that you need spiritual healing from the doctor or doctors, that you need Jesus Christ. As long as we humbly ask the Lord for forgiveness with a repentant heart, our Lord, through the sacrament of confession, will reconcile us to Him. Indeed, St. Isidore justly states, all hope consists in confession. Remember what God says about trust in the scriptures. In many instances, he says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In Psalms chapter 56, verse 3 through 4, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? And in John verse 14, verse 1, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. The Catholic Church has an extensive history of bestowing help to those who struggle with utter despair. The Church provides the help quite efficiently. She relies on the Master Jesus Christ and His sacraments. It was Christ who gave the apostles, the co-founders of the Catholic Church, the authority to forgive sins. In John chapter 20, verse 22, Christ breathed on his apostles, giving them the Holy Spirit, and said to them, this is in John chapter 20, verse 22, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So Christ didn't give anyone, you and I, the authority to have our sins forgiven by talking to God directly. Just imagine talking to God directly in a car, in a park, driving on a highway or in bed. That's not what God established. God didn't establish a way in which you may be deceived into believing that you are talking to God. If you want to know more about the sacrament or confession, click on the link I provided you within the descriptions. Don't sink in despair. Persistently rely on the church's sacraments, especially the Eucharist and reconciliation. And you may want to learn about a saint that is very much connected to despair, but most importantly, connected to the great mercy of God. You want to know about Saint Maria Goretti, who indeed reflected God's inexhaustible mercy, as I said. She was an 11-year-old girl who was very devoted to God. <gasps> very devoted to God at that age? Yes, at that tender age. She felt victimized by Alessandro Serinelli, age 20. Alessandro tried to seduce her forcibly and even threatened to kill her. She would resist, but Maria refused and refused fiercely. Then Alessandro stabbed her 14 times. She was rushed to the hospital, but she succumbed to her wounds. However, as she was dying, she forgave Alessandro. She is one of the youngest saints of the Catholic Church. Did she forgive her killer as she was dying? Yes, she did. Wow! I said that she reflected God's inexhaustible mercy. Remember that as Christ was dying on the cross, he prayed to his father to forgive his killers. We read this in Luke chapter 23, 34. Quote, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Alessandro was found guilty, convicted, and thrown into prison. He regretted what he did, and he was indeed driven to despair. But he truly and sincerely repented and even received a vision of Maria Goretti, who told him that she had forgiven him. Ho oh, ho, just imagine. Alessandro went to confession and had his sins forgiven by Christ through his priest. Since Alessandro was not 21 when the tragedy took place, and that was the adult age in Italy at the time, he was sentenced to 30 years in prison as opposed to being executed. During those years, he became a model prisoner and was released after spending nearly 30 years in prison. He died a lay brother of a Franciscan monastery where he worked as a gardener and porter for the next 30 years. That's an amazing story. I can't believe it! Oh, you better believe it. Christ bestows the Church's sacraments. They are the only conduits of grace that are able to bring down the walls of any sin. Any sin that has positioned itself within your heart as a powerful city or nation that is impregnable and unconquerable. On your own strength or relying on anything else that is not really of Christ's sacraments, you cannot bring down the wall that protect that horrible city. It is like the story of Jericho in the Bible. Within those walls, you have the city of your passions and desires, a city in which you also find yourself depressed, broken, 
wanting and in despair. The church is the only institution of the world that brings those worlds down through the sacrificing and actual graces that God gives, shares that the church bestows upon one's souls through the sacraments. But the person who truly explains the walls of Jericho better is a doctor of the church, Saint Jerome. But his explanation of the story of Jericho is the subject of my next video. You can click the link below to see it. So what to do with despair? Give it to Jesus. He is the only one who through the church he left on earth earth can heal your despair. If you rely on your own strength, intelligence, or anything else that is not really of Christ, you cannot bring down the walls that protect the city of your passions, desires, and brokenness, the place in which you may be a prisoner and in despair. This is it, my dear audience. God love you all. I am El Señor Moreno.